Okay, good afternoon. Um, the pleasure to chair this afternoon's session and uh, introduce the next speaker, which is Thomas Laurent. Thomas is the CEO and co-founder of Predictive Digital Twin pioneer, Axelos. This company is ba has his global headquarters based in Lausanne, next to us here. Uh, and Laurent is a MIT alum alumnus. Uh, he has spent seven years building Axelos, and this company is acting as a digital transformation disruptor today. Um, Thomas achieved practically during this year, growing the business into a very successful international company that has now operation in Europe, in US, in Southeast Asia. And Axelos' most recent founding round in involved as well Shell Ventures and Future Energy Venture being very successful. So this company brings technology to market in order to transform industrial asset management in oil and gas, offshore wind, and beyond. So you see then there is an emerging nature of such technology that has led Thomas to represent deep tech interest and potential as a world energy leader within the World Energy Council network of global CEOs and government leaders as well. Being a board member of GWC at COP26 uh, and uh, acting as a technology pioneers at the World Economic Forum. Let's welcome Thomas, and Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so we, we'll, uh, we've seen yesterday some, uh, some fantastic uh, talks um, on the technology and the, the research side of things. Uh, I, first of all, I'd like to say uh, some of the speakers yesterday within Axelos, they are basically our R&D idols, like uh, you know, Karen Wilcox, uh, we work with her, but also uh, Alfio Quarteroni. Uh, those are people that we really look up to in terms of, uh, of R&D. And then what we do is uh, <coughs> we, uh, we take the next step, which is uh, take it to market, which is uh, equally difficult, but a very different type of endeavor, of course. Um, <coughs> so the talk today is about physics-based digital twin when it comes to net zero 2050. So just to place it, net zero 2050, that's, uh, that's really the late motive right now, which is we must get to zero carbon by 2050 or earlier. Uh, and then there is a roadmap that was released by the International Energy Agency um, earlier this year, which is a fantastic roadmap saying, okay, this is how we can transform our energy system from a carbon-based, mostly, energy system to a zero-carbon energy system. And, uh, and this is investments we have to make. And so that's an extremely <coughs> uh, useful roadmap that is driving the strategy in, uh, into many large companies. And, and also for uh, technology applications, it's uh, very important to have this in mind. All right. So <coughs> let's delve into um, a bit of a semantic about digital twins. Um, the way we look at it is you have uh, virtual digital twins, which are essentially a 3D intelligized asset. So you have a 3D representation of an asset. You've got some data database, which tells you <coughs> uh, the history of the asset and those type of things. And then you have the process digital twin. The process digital twin is a digital twin which represents, for example, for example the chemical process in a refinery and helps you optimize that process. It could also be uh, what we've seen and heard about process in, uh, in uh, manufacturing and all those type of things. And then another category, and there's many more, could be the physics-based or the structural digital twin, which is really all the mechanical assets which underlie the process, which make the, the process possible in the first place, and what is the operating envelope for those mechanical assets, and how to optimize operations of those assets. All right, so you're going to get exposed to a little bit of uh, Axelos marketing today. I, I apologize for this, but uh, such is life. Uh, <coughs> what we brought to market is essentially the technology that uh, can be uh, shown, the simulation side of the technology that can be shown in, a, in, a, in Karen Wilcox, Director Wilcox's presentation, so reduced basis FE. And what we achieve with this is models of unprecedented size. So here you have a model with every detail of an asset which is the size of several aircraft carriers. And you have a much faster solving time. So typically here would be 
in this case, actually 100,000 times faster than the traditional methodologies, finite element analysis, would be 100,000 times faster on this asset. And we also augment the accuracy at the same time, so a 10x in accuracy, okay? So <coughs> then the question becomes, once you have this, time of this type of technological power, what do you do with it? Where do you derive value for, for people in, in the industry? And how can you build the future with this type of technology? Okay. So a bit of credentials here. Uh, this is a digital twin we have for the company deployed over the planet, both for renewable, both for uh, oil and gas. We, we protect today, we help protect $10 billion of uh, oil and gas production for Shell, for example, today, and that's only going to go up. Uh, we also help reduce uh, the steel in the foundation of offshore wind farm by up to 30% with partners like Lamprell. Uh, we can also work with partners like a Axiona on the life extension of uh, blades. And this is the type of things you, you get from the technology uh, <coughs> to get started. Um, the technology, we're not going to go into the details of it because we have yesterday. But what it does is it takes a, a divide and conquer approach to uh, finite element analysis. So we decompose the problem into many components, and then we're able to solve this, uh, uh, and that's a you know very reasonable cost because they're small system. We're able to reassemble them, and and we're able to parameterize with several parameters each component. So you can end up with a system which is one very large and two uh, parameterized with up to thousands of parameters. Okay. Uh, yeah, the fact that the, the solver is patented, uh, not our choice initially, but something that we definitely uh, defend, uh, with uh, MIT being the patent owner behind it. And then, and then we, we get to those uh, type of models that we will see in more details. Let me, let me give you an idea of what the industry is able to do with finite element analysis today. <coughs> I mean, I, the, you may find this caricatural, but on, on the top, uh, top right on that picture, you can see blades in a, in a gas turbine. The most we've ever seen a manufacturer being able to resolve in terms of number of blades with the full physics, meaning the contact, the plasticity, the creep, and so on, in the design stage of a gas turbine is three blades. Now, a compressor or a turbine will have thousands of blades. So there's always a lot of assumption and symmetry assumption about what can be resolved with those problems. Okay. And it's the same for oil and gas platform. With full resolution, it's usually down to one joint on the platform, and so on and so on. Once you apply this technology, you really have a view on the entire models because there is no limit to scale. So now we can do entire compressor stage with no symmetry assumption uh, in, a, in a design stage, for example. Okay. All right, so what does it mean for legacy assets, meaning oil and gas in our case, and how can we apply this technology in what is essentially a, a very large market uh, in oil and gas. Be before I go into this, I'll, I'll say a few words about myself. Um, you know, I, uh, I drive an electric car. That's, that's when I drive, because most of the time I'm actually in a train or, or on a bike. Uh, I've been coming to the office here at the uh, EPFL Innovation Park for nearly 10 years, uh, on a train and a bike. I, uh, I try to compensate every single flight that I take, and I try to live in places which uh, don't burn any carbon, right? I mean, I think it's uh, really the important issue of our generation, which is going to drive many, many other issues. Um, and so I'm extremely careful with it. This being said, we will need oil and gas for the next 20 or 30 years, okay? So in the, in the roadmap, to, uh, to the uh, energy transition, to net zero 2050, the International Energy Ag Agency says, look, we really do not need new oil field. Okay, we don't need to drill for more oil, but we do need to extend the life of the current asset. And in fact, if we help the operators extend the life of oil and gas asset, then they don't have to sink capex into new asset. They can, they, they can actually put that capex into renewables, for example. So it's really a very important part of the roadmap is enabling the life extension of assets. Okay, so back to, this is called an FPSO. It's a floating production, storage, and offloading unit. It's, again, the size of several aircraft carriers. So what we've done for an asset like this, in addition to be able to prove that it's worthy for a number of extra years, we've been able to compress workflows that used to take six months 
on those type of assets, and that was called reanalysis. And we've compressed those workflows to 48 hours. So that's what, of course, you would expect this given the speed we have. Now, you have to create a digital thread to do that, right? It's not just about applying a faster solver. Everything has to be down to one button push, and everything has to be linked together. But we've done that jointly with Shell. In the process, we'll, uh, we've, I we've increased the accuracy by a factor of 10. And this is entirely validated by what's called the class society, so in this case, Lloyd Register. So they spent six months to validate the technology along with us, and today they're, they're basically using the technology themselves. Okay. So what this gives, uh, in terms of the digital thread that I was describing, is that you apply this thousand times faster technology on the asset, and you're going to start impacting the real condition of the asset, so the thickness of every panel, uh, into the model, and you have an extremely detailed model that you start running, and you every wave that hits the asset, every large wave that hit the asset, every tank loading and offloading that creates fatigue on the asset is impacted on the digital twin. And as a result, we get where to inspect. So the hotspot that you see here, that's basically where to inspect the asset, and we go from a an inspection program which was a rolling inspection program that took five years to achieve with people full-time on board the asset for five years doing this. And that was inspected in 15,000 hotspots to a program which has to inspect only 300 hotspots and is more likely to really focus the attention in the right place and really catch defects early when they are cheap and, uh, and easy to fix. I'll show you more details of that. So it's back to this model, which is decomposed into components and uh, and then um, and then goes into this digital twin. And here we, we're, I'll just let you uh, I'll stop speaking, let you meditate on this. But this is the kind of details we get in the model. There's about 100 million degrees of freedom in FEA terms in uh, in this model. It solves, in, in this case, in 14 seconds per solve. We, we catch there's, there's very detailed things about the moorings and those type of things that are uh, essential components that we have to model in, uh, in very high fidelity. And when you see the, scroll, the, the mouse, it, it basically highlights components in the models the species that we have solved ahead of time. Here the mesh resolution is very high because this is a potential hotspot, so it's fully resolved, what's called T1 for the fatigue. Moorings, you really don't want those guys to break. And that's the waves impacting the asset. So every wave will actually lead to a different state of stress and drive fatigue differently in the asset. Now back to what Karen was showing with the drones uh, the other day, you could actually imagine that if you have the MetOcean data for a certain sheep and you know how it's loaded, you could actually route the sheep so it has to minimize fatigue on the sheep and, um, and basically extend the life of the sheep because you always route it for what's best for the specific sheep, specific loading, specific history of the sheep. Now, <coughs> so this is about scale and, and workflow. Now I want to discuss a little bit accuracy. So some of you will be very familiar with this, some of you will discover this, but basically there are, a lot of those assets are fatigue driven. Fatigue is ultimately what's gonna um, make the asset unworthy and um, and there's different standards to compute fatigue. So the simplest standard is essentially what the what the Eiffel Tower was built upon. It's beam theory coupled with uh, stress concentration factors, right? And then the most accurate standard is actually you know applying FEA uh, very precisely on the joint, as you can see upper right, and uh, and then you you basically completely shift the kind of results you get. And both are standards that are published by class societies. Okay, but you can de you can basically decide to go at a level one type of standard, or you can go down to level three, and you unlock more operational capacity as you go deeper into the standards. Okay, now what what is unique about um, 
the technology is that we can resolve all the joint fully coupled on, a, on an oil and gas platform fully detailed. So those, those, those gets to be pretty big models pretty quickly. And this is a kind of fatigue that you get with SCF on the left or with fully resolved joints on the right. In red, all those joints actually were not, um, you know, we n were not fit for purpose for the life extension of the asset. And on the right, all the joints are fit for purpose. But the difference is sometimes huge, right? The first one has nine years of fatigue life left into it. But if you apply the level three standards, you go to 193 years of fatigue life left into it. Okay, and there's intermediary level in between. Okay, so that's a, having the accuracy to resolve the model fully is a gigantic difference, either for life extension, but also, and we'll talk about it for engineering, because as we engineer new assets in the energy transition, we have to go into much leaner engineering than what we've been doing so far. Okay, um, <coughs> I want to show a little bit of a zoom time on how we resolve the condition of the asset. That's also extremely important. As we bring those technology, you know, digital twin is all about operations. It's not about design anymore. It's bring those type of technology in operation. So as you want to resolve the asset, this is a case where there's a crawler robot that does a hot inspection around a pressure vessel. So you don't need to shut down the process. You get a fully resolved state of the corrosion and the pitting in the pressure vessel with 20 million data points. But what they couldn't do is basically then solve with level three standards what's going on. Now, in the model, we basically get the data from the crawler robot, impact it on a scan plan, and you can see the corrosion is very finely impacted on the asset here. And then we're able to run the standards. In this case, uh, API 579 would be the standard for pressure vessel. And we're able to run the standard. And again, in this case, this level three analysis is 10 times more accurate than what has ever been, ever, ever been done for pressure vessels, but it's coming down from three weeks of work to seven hours of work, okay? And when you have 400 pressure vessels in a given operation, that does matter, right? So we go from data input, that's when we create the digital twin, to actually creating the, the, the FEA, to having a scan plan, to scanning, impacting this. If your pressure vessels are all the same, the first part of the of the work up until the thickness profile, the top part, you only do once, right? And then you can do you can repeat things. So you basically do once your digital twin for example a wind turbine, a pressure vessel. This is a one time cost to making things really right. And then after that you can run things in a few hours and have a level of understanding of your operation uh, operational envelope which is very advanced and which is completely compatible with standards. I mean, the standards are recognizing FEA and, and the RBFEA technology is built upon FEA and is compatible with it. And then the last, the last step in all this is <coughs> it really has to be integrated into the decision-making process for the operator. So once you're running those very advanced FEA model, people in operations are very busy. I mean, the last thing they really want to look at is an FEA model. Okay, they want to get results, they want to drive decision according to standard, according to the, the digital twin. And the more we can simplify this and integrate it into their dashboard, the better it is. So in this case, we're going to look at an asset which is a, called a cocker, and a, a cocker are assets which are in, uh, in refineries. And uh, people who, who work downstream uh, oil and gas uh, get extremely excited when you, when you tell them you can help them with cockers because they break often and it costs a lot of money when it breaks. It basically shuts the plant down. So you're often talking about millions of dollars per hour when a cocker uh, is, uh, is uh, down. So what we do is we integrate this with the sensors that are on the cocker. And by the way, this is now going into multi-physics because you have structural, thermal, radiation, every everything is impacted into, uh, into this model. And then we're able to say in real time what is the, tr the stress utilization as, for example, they do a turnaround on the plant. So they will shut down the plant. And the cocker, they, they want, they have to, what they call a pressure temperature curve, an MPT curve, and they want to understand how fast they can go for the shutdown and restart the plant, right? Should it be three days? Should it be, can it be done in a day and a half? That's a lot of money at stake.
So that's what engineers really want to see. They want to see the curves that they have used for many years, but now fully resolved via the digital twin with the standards actually uh, being applied. Yeah, and uh, I forgot to mention, but there's also time stepping. So this is a uh, this is a time dependent problem, of course. So that that's really a different level of complexity for the models. All right. So now, what if we project this into what we have to do, what we have to achieve <coughs> on the energy transition front? Um, Okay, I must say, the, for those of you who work into the energy transition day in, day out, if some of you do, it's, it, the, the numbers, the figures are absolutely mind-boggling, what we have to achieve. So you really have to start taking an exponential mindset on everything that you consider when it comes to the energy transition. I'll just give uh, one example. So we're, we're really focused on a subset of this, which is offshore wind today. Uh, there's many more tools in the energy transition all the way from the king of energy, which is solar now, to you know <coughs> the, the left field uh, silver bullet, which is uh, fusion. But this is what the International Energy Agency says about uh, offshore wind in particular for net zero 2050. So the total worldwide capacity today, everything we've built in offshore wind over the past 30 years, that's 30 gigawatt. The Global Wind Energy Council, which is the industry body for wind, has actually stated very ambitious target that we should build by 2030 30 gigawatt per year. So to today's total global install capacity every year, right? <coughs> but when they did the math, when the IEA did the math, they found out that even though offshore wind is a tiny part of the energy transition, we have to build three times today's total capacity every year as of 2030, 80 gigawatt per year. Now, this is something that we can't afford not to do, just to be very clear. If you think it's difficult, try living in a three degree world, because that's going to be absolutely awful. Okay, And even Switzerland will not be Switzerland anymore. I can guarantee that. Um, so. We have to achieve that, and we have to take an exponential mindset to that. We have to work together as an industry, because it's very powerful to work together to achieve those goals. And, um, and, and now let's project a little bit what digital can do for this, because when you look at this, what you have is an exponential need, right? And we all know that what's exponential in industry, it's Moore's law, right? So what's digitization of an industry, it's making an industry compatible with Moore's law. So if we can start digitalizing more and more of what we do in the industry, we may be able to achieve those targets. Um, and in fact, <coughs> it, has been, it has been done for solar. So if you look at, um, at the left side of this slide, that's 2009, that's the price per megawatt hour of solar energy, PVs, photovo photovoltaic panels. In 2009, that's 359. That's very expensive, right? 359 dollars per megawatt hour. If you follow that curve and you take it all the way to 2021, you get to the king of energy, which is 36 dollars per megawatt hour for solar, and it's going to go down in some regions to 10 dollars. Okay. Um, so that's extraordinary. That means that actually in some regions today, installing solar panels is actually more cost effective. New solar panel is more cost effective than to keep on running an existing coal power plant, for example, because to run the coal, you have to extract the coal, you have to bring it in, you have to run, you know, for the furnace and for the steam turbine and all of this and the alternator and all of this has a cost. Whereas when it comes to solar, the sun shows up every day. That's guaranteed. Okay. It shines on your panel, and right here you get electricity. Okay, so it's a much more elegant way to actually derive energy than even coal, which was used as a fairly cheap by countries like uh, India or Germany and so on. But actually, it's a much more effective way today today to do it. That's why we we have a fighting chance in the energy transition. But solar is not adequate for every region in the world, and certainly it's very well complemented by uh, by wind. 
You know, the saying goes, well, when the sun shines, there's no wind. And when there's a lot of wind, the sun doesn't shine. Okay, so it's a very complementary form of energy. And if you couple that with storage, then it's, you get into a very good place. Now, the cost for fixed offshore wind, I've put on the right as a, as a band, but it's basically between uh, 50 and 80. So it's becoming quite competitive in the region where it's deployed today, but I'll get to that. It's not easy to actually deploy fixed. And then 80% <coughs> of the offshore wind capacity on the planet will be floating offshore wind. So every large 20 million people coastal city on the planet, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Shanghai, Tokyo, and so on, all those guys, the water drops pretty quickly off the coast, and you can't actually put a fixed foundation. You have to put a floating foundation there. Okay? Now, the cost of floating offshore wind today is actually fairly prohibitive. It's $160 per megawatt hour. So we need to, we need to take this down by a factor of two or three very quickly. In order to do this, we can throw out incremental innovation immediately. We will not succeed in applying offshore wind with an incre incremental innovation mindset in time for the energy transition. OK, so either it will basically be too costly and cost too much and be an unfair transition, or it will simply not be deployed because a launch of offshore wind will be eaten by solar and other better technologies to do it. So we have to throw out incremental innovation. OK, that's clear. And then we have to basically bring speed and scale in the deployment of a, a floating offshore wind. And it doesn't stop just on the technology side, because actually today to commission a wind farm, it's eight years. So the floating wind farms, you know, the 30, the 80 gigawatt per year that we want to build by 2030, <coughs> we, have, we have to start on those at today's pace. We have to start on those next year in 2022. So we should already be working on 80 gigawatt of new uh, floating wind as we speak. A lot of this is on the policy front, half of it, you know, permitting, policy and so on. And frankly, it's absolutely not the, the topic of the talk today, but we need to digitalize that part also. So if you're, if you're working on a satellite uh, data to look at uh, bird migrations, and you can resolve that, you take one year out of that. Because today they, they put people to sit and, and look at whether the birds are migrating for the site for one year. You know, well, maybe we could do this in a digital way via satellite data. And, and all those things are very important. This is, this is why we really have to work together on making this happen. And then there's the technology side of it from, um, from let's say, a, a turbine or an operator perspective, which today takes four years. Now, of course, if you could do what we've done for the FPSO case, where you take a workflow that takes six months and you bring it down to 48 hours and you make it 10 times more accurate in the process, then there's a good chance you can do something on that front to shorten those four years of development. It does take working together because everything is interlinked in developing that. Okay? And that's not where the mechanical industry historically has been very strong. They're, they're a very siloed industry compared to what happened on the electronics side, which is why electronics is more successful. <coughs> so, just a step back here, uh, when I talked about incremental innovation versus disruptive innovation, just, uh, uh, of course, this is fairly Axelos-centric, you know, I'm the CEO of the company, I'll talk about Axelos, but there's no monopoly on innovation by any company, we all know that, a innovation is a very decentralized process, but one process, one, one concept to really, really master for anyone working in this is the concept of innovation curve. So the concept of innovation curve just say that there is an incumbent technology and there is a disruptive innovation that comes. And typically, an incumbent technology will be only yielding incremental gains towards the end of its life. So that happened, of course, the classical example is a steam versus electricity. So at some point, it took a while to convert everything to electricity, but very quickly, you could do a lot more with electricity than you could do with, a, with a steam. Okay. Those are called general purpose technology. And of course, uh, finite element analysis and all those type of design tools, they are also a general purpose technology, right? They can be applied to any type of asset, mechanic and even electronics. So as you, as you shift innovation curve, and, and of course, for any given project, there are important shifts to make innovation in innovation curve, and they, those are strategic choices that 
the project developer has to make. All right, so it's not like it's not like systematically they should be oh this is RBFA I should do I should do a shift in innovation curve because of RBFA. It's more of a strategic mindset of we have a project which is going to cost us a few billion dollars. We want to win that project in the first place, provide return on equity in that project. And today it's not possible, so how do we do that, right? And we, we sit down, look at which innovation curve we can sit, we, we can shift, and then we go all in on some shift in innovation curve, okay? So that's discussions we have often with our, with our partners, which are very large companies, and we tell them, look, you, you have a strategic decision to make. You don't have to use our technology, but you have to consider this as one of the potential shifts in your innovation curve process. And... Uh, and it's very important for uh, floating wind. So again, 80% of, uh, of total capacity for offshore wind is going to be in floating because what happens is you can put a fixed offshore wind up to, say, 40 or 50 meter depth. So that's, um, that's what you have in the North Sea. Uh, of course, you don't want the wind turbines to be right in front of the beach. You know, nobody likes to see a wind turbine just in front of their uh, beautiful um, beach house. So typically, people want, uh, policymakers want the wind turbines 50 kilometers of the coast. And there's only very few regions in the world where you have shallow water 50 kilometers from the coast. So that's the North Sea, that's Indonesia, and uh, some of the East Coast, Northeast of the United States. <coughs> that's pretty much it. All the rest of the world will have to be floating wind. And today it's way too expensive. So what the challenge is in floating wind is basically you're putting turbines, which uh, the rotors of the latest turbines that we're going to work with, 232 meters is, um, is from uh, the, the, the diameter of the rotor. And uh, it, the, the, the tip, um, the top uh, of the blade is as, as high as the Eiffel Tower. And then the floater that goes underneath is pretty much the size of two-thirds of a, of a football pitch, a soccer pitch. So you have absolutely huge asset, but that's one turbine. And in a wind turbine, offshore floating wind farm, you're going to have 100 or 300 of those or 500 of those, okay, to make like a five or seven gigawatt wind farm. So everything you can do here to de-risk that project and to optimize the cost of that project is going to accelerate the energy transition. You have to convince people to fund that project. And, uh, and there's only a few demonstrators of this type of technology in the water. They're like three turbines of the coast of Portugal. We work with, this is a partner called the Principal Power with uh, EDPR. They generate 25, uh, giga, uh, 25 megawatt of uh, electricity just of the coast of Portugal. That's only three turbine. You have uh, another one called High Wind in the North Sea. You've got maybe three demonstrators that are actually generating electricity today. Uh, you have 50 concepts which exist because it's still a native nascent industry. It's really a startup industry. And you have already today 40 sites which are identified. So 50 concepts, 40 sites, 2,000 combination, and you basically have free demonstrator to, to derive any data from today. And you have this gigantic problem of the energy transition that we really have to, you know, and it's a question of survival for some of the companies we work with, right? Remember, today a company like Orsted, which used to be the Danish operator for oil and gas, is called, was called Dong, now Orsted. That company, which is fully offshore wind today, is worth more than British Petroleum because they have done the transition. So all those companies now have gigantic financial pressure to actually do this, but they don't have any past data on how to do it. So they're going to have to now decide to do this, and the digital twin is going to be absolutely key to do that. So you can accelerate the validation, you can prove the industrialization, and then the idea is really that you can ramp up faster to multi-gigawatt type of wind farms, and at the same time you can actually lower the cost of, uh, of, the, of the electricity that you generate and increase the return on, uh, on equity for the operators. So the key in this, and here I'm just going to ask you to project a little bit um, what, you, uh, what you have seen uh, on the oil and gas side, because again, this is a new industry, so we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, as much eye candy as we have on the oil and gas side. But the key in this is to really, it's all fatigue driven. So that floater weights 4,000 tons, 
maybe three or four thousand tons. The Eiffel Tower weighs seven thousand tons. Okay, so it's nearly as heavy. It's half the, half the weight of the Eiffel Tower. So first of all, it's overdesigned, but even then. It's incurring a lot of stress as you have this rotating turbine on top of it and the waves that are hitting it. And so it's all really how much can you optimize the design to shave off some steel out of that floater. And then once you're in operation, there are many configurations for this wind turbine. You can, you can, uh, th there's ballast in there. So you can actually change the tilt of the turbine. You can, you can change the orientation of the floater. There's many things you can change to basically accumulate fatigue in one place and not in another place and so on. And so once you've actually optimized the design, you're going to have an asset which is uh, maybe hopefully half the weight of what they designed today. So we're going to shave half the weight through design optimization. But then you're going to have a very lean asset. And in order to get 25 years of life out of it, you're going to want to run this asset in operation, fully understanding the fatigue that you incur at every moment. And in fact, you should even be able to derive your fatigue cost. So this operation here, if I operate like this in the next two hours, it's going to cost me this much in fatigue, and the market price of the electricity I can command now is such. Therefore, I make money or I don't make money. Okay? And that sounds like science fiction, but that's exactly what uh, ARPA-E went after in a project called Atlantis. So it's a, it's a $28 million program that they put in place uh, last year. And we won the, the largest grant in that program with, uh, with uh, uh, EDPR, um, Principal Power, uh, the US Navy, uh, American Bureau of Shipping, and so on. And in that program, basically, we're going to understand in real time the fatigue of the floater to decide how to operate the asset and how to make money and how to make floating offshore wind economical. Okay? So that's the market, market fatigue optimization that I have on the slide. And then the other side of it is actually called, I mean, take the two words at the top, in operations design. So from a digital twin, you're going to be able to derive how to optimize the next generation of design for the assets. In operations design. You really observe what's going on in operation, and you design the next generation of asset, and so on and so on, so that you can further optimize. Uh, I think that's it. I think the rest is uh, is for us to build uh, together. It's like we really have to build a future based on those uh, on those new technologies. Uh, the final say I would say is uh, extremely important given what we have to achieve that the industry works better together. So there's a there were there were some questions yesterday about how to share data. Extremely important to be able to share data so that we can optimize the system without sharing any IP. You want, you, you want to be very careful about retaining the property of the IP, of course, but you want to be able to optimize the system. And that, again, that's what happened in electronic design. We have to carry this over into the uh, engineering industry. Yeah. With this, I'm uh, a bit early, but we have, uh, we have time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Impressive talk with impressive numbers and uh, very uh, interesting approach uh, for the, the future in energy. Any question for the room? Yes, please, the, in the back. Mike is coming on, the, on your right. Yeah, I'm, I'm possibly a party pooper, you know, but uh, 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 if you are a normal manager, let's say I am one, you know, and you get data, and one of the digital twin tells you, you know, the life expectancy is 9.4 years, and the, one that, uh, the other one is 194 years. You know that a normal ship uh, has a lifespan of about 25 to 30 years. What should you believe, you know? And I don't trust all these things. And uh, it's nice to have all these numbers, but I've learned also shit in and shit out, you know. And these these are enormous investments if something goes wrong. Yep. So how can you manage the trust level yep. to get from your gut experience, which I have, you know, to these people who can yep. walk about the sw uh, across the swimming pool? Yeah, yeah. So uh, very important question. The trust here is key. Uh, class societies. So we we don't come up with numbers for fatigue life. We never, ever would do that. We are not subject matter experts in those type of assets. We only deliver software which is compatible with the standards that have been applied for many, many years. 
Okay, so the class society in this case is a Lloyd Register. They have different standards of uh, different level of uh, classification. And if you can go in full detail, you unlock more life. Everybody in the industry knows this. So actually, you know, this is a, a relief because like this is where machine learning and AI is going to have a problem to, to crack those type of use case because there are no standards that recognize uh, AI or machine learning for those type of application. But when it comes to finite element analysis, actually those standards use FEA, they're there. So the trust is already there as long as you can make the tool compatible with standards. And in this case, I mean, Shell paid the uh, Lloyd Register for six months to actually review everything we'd done on the asset, benchmark everything, and make sure that everything was absolutely compatible with the standards and that there was no, no error. Yeah. But the, the other thing is, uh, so the other thing is when it comes to the asset you see here, so for wind, I think the mindset also has to change. Uh, too much of the mindset in floating wind today or in wind, in offshore wind, comes from the oil and gas industry. It comes from the standards uh, uh, that, that were addicted for oil and gas. And those standards are rightfully extremely conservative, right? When it comes to offshore wind, there is no ecological issue with a turbine breaking down. There's no safety issue. There's nobody on those turbines. And so we have, as an industry, we have to ask ourselves the question, actually, can we afford 5% of loss over the, the, the life of the asset? You know, 5% of the blades basically flying off, 5% uh, of, of the floaters uh, breaking down before the end of life. If we can take the cost down by 50%, but we only have 95% of the asset getting to 25 years of design life, that's okay. That's a good result because the alternative to that is cook ourselves with 35 degrees wet bulb temperature, which is when your body cook itself. And that's gonna happen, right? It's gonna happen in, in, uh, in India. We've seen it, we've seen science fiction happening today in Canada this year. Come on, a town that disappears in one day in the flames in 50 degree heat in Canada? Really? So we have to change the mindset around how we view the risk and we have to accept some kind of risk on those asset. It's not the oil and gas industry, it's here to really make us make a progress on the energy transition. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, for he was first. Sandra, please. And then we have here in front. Thank you for the nice and fascinating talk. I w I'm, I'm curious to know how much the model that is beyond the optimization you, you showed at the beginning that covered by the patent, the MIT patent, how much is case sensitive? So in principle, uh, you know, we, we can ap apply the same approach with a plethora of completely different applications just to, to manage, I don't know, a bioreactor for a pharma production. Of course, data are completely different. I don't know, number of uh, cell working, amount of glucose in the reactor, amount of lactate as bacteria suffering. But in principle, the approach is similar. So I can imagine to develop a twin of my reactor, bioreactor, and for example, extend lifetime, and that will save a lot of money for the biopharma. So the question is, how much, in your experience, is the modeling beyond case sensitive? And if tomorrow yeah. I would like to buy your technology for my bioreactor, yeah. is it required still a development, or is ready yeah. key to use? So I I the, the core technology is a general purpose technology, and so you can, you can carry it. Uh, to those type of application, the core technology, right? And, um, and okay, in the case of the coker that I showed, we did have to include radiation, which we didn't have before. And so sometimes we have to augment the core technology, but then you can carry it to different things. But you're absolutely right. In the, in the go-to market, the, today the finite element analysis software was sold as a fairly generic type of software, which <coughs> people use to design this or design that, but they, they don't build hyper-specific workflows uh, for a given design. They just give this to um, a company like uh, General Electric, well, which is a bigger uh, ANSI shop, will use ANSI to actually design, okay, their, their, their gas turbine. And, uh, and they will create their own workflow to do that. As you go to market and 
sell FEA into operations. And ANSYS also and Axelos, we both think that it's a much bigger market ultimately than the actual design market to sell this in operation. And the design market is not bad. It's a $10 billion market, but you know, in software sales, but the operations market we believe is much bigger. As you sell in operations, you have to verticalize every single solution that you sell. And so basically, for the case of your reactor, you would have to basically, again, verticalize completely and create a new product out of, uh, out of this general purpose technology uh, to make it happen. And, uh, and so this is where, again, working together will be very important because, um, you know, they, I mean, uh, <coughs> there's a number of efforts to, uh, to accelerate uh, FEA, but none of those efforts will be able to address the entire market. So partnership and those type of things will be very important. Yeah. Question here. I, <clears throat> I would have a symmetric question to the one that has been asked before. If you have these huge differences between the performance that you observed, you could also interpret it as that the current methods that we're using for engineering are extremely suboptimal. And this raises in my mind as member of an institution that is building engineers, the idea that what is your opinion about using these new tools, twins, to impact on the education of the engineers? We, yeah, there must be something this is, wrong this in is what an we do. Awesome question. I will tell you in the go to market here, we have to become very good at deciding who we talk to and who we don't talk to. 80, 90% of engineers, it's like FEA came with a Bible or even before the Bible on stone tablets. That is a ridiculous mindset. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we educate our people so that they turn up like that? FEA was an algorithm invented in the 1960s. Okay, that's already 50 years old. I can guarantee if you try to use a 50-year-old algorithm in Google Map now to go to Zurich, it will take three days to give you an answer. So why are we using a 50-year-old algorithm to design our mechanical world? And why do people think it came with the Bible? This is a ridiculous mindset. I think it's really time that we regain humane, uh, human inventiveness in the education of engineers. You know, inventiveness is absolutely key to cracking the energy transition. So many people think that electric cars will never happen still today. Oh, come on, guys. There are better cars on every level. Okay? So we have to break beyond that, and we have to train our engineers in a way where, you know, if you look at the great engineers of the past, they're not just engineers, they're also artists, Da Vinci, right? But also the guys in Scotland, in Glasgow, all the guys that built Scotland at the great engineering time of Scotland, they were also into art. So this combination of inventiveness and discipline of the engineering, that's the winning combination. If we're not there, we're in the past already. Thank you. Let me ask you a bit more provocative question. Um, you presented, the presentation has two parts. One, a bit about oil and gas for oil exploration on the marine platform, and this one on renewables, right? So you are taking these two paths in the company. Now, you make a statement somewhere, then when deploying this digital twin to oil and gas, you make a case that these guys are not looking from new exploration, which I, I think we have to be a bit naive to think that because you see all the pressure that has been in US to open new exploration field in Alaska, in the North Ocean and so on. So where there is a line of ethics in serving this company, giving them the tools to do better and continue all exploration for a long time more efficient, instead of putting more effort on this part that is your second part of the talk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so great question also. Uh, certainly very close to my heart, I can, I can guarantee that. So um, actually, first I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer with uh, something that will divert a little bit, but then I'll come back to it. So, you know, wh wh I mean, obviously a question that my kids would ask me, right? Come on, you're working with an iron gas company, what's wrong with you? Okay, and I have to swallow every time I hear that because at some level they're right. Um, but then I'm driving an electric car when they ask the question and I say, look around you. How many electric cars do you see? Right? Still, everybody's still buying. I mean, so 
as long as there are people consuming oil, oil will keep being produced to some extent. So first of all, I would say the first answer to that question is, as consumers, let's act in the energy transition because we are more than consuming, we are acting in the, as we consume, okay? So <clears throat> now I'll go back to the, to the key question here. I mean, yeah, I am the CEO of the company and I, have, I do have to decide on that. And, and you could argue the same thing on defense and, 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 and issues like this. I'll tell you, actually, it was difficult up until the Net Zero 2050 roadmap. Now I can go and uh, we have many executives in the company that actually come from exclusively having worked in oil and gas for 20 years and then they come with us and, and we open the possibilities for them to work elsewhere and they love it too. But they're also pragmatic. They know that the oil and gas industry has brought tremendous benefits to humanity because they brought energy to us and energy is a huge benefit. It's just that it refused to look upon the externalities and to cost in the externalities of what they were doing. That's where they were actually you know, really bad. But if we do the Net Zero 2050 roadmap, as you've seen, it's an extremely ambitious roadmap. So as long as you work on that roadmap and as long as you refuse to work on you know, a company that has uh, drilling rigs and those type of things and you work just on the roadmap, I think this is where we've put the line for, for ourselves in terms of ethics and certainly we enforce it. So, uh, yeah. I mean, last year I had an executive visiting a coal mine. I was like, come on, what are you doing there? Take the next flight back. I don't want you there. So, so where, where do you see in time um, inflection point? Because many people sh mentioned this. This is the century when we see an inflection point of these renewables, whatever yeah. is the future strategy, will I really <coughs> happen and take over the other... So when do you see it in time? So, so I think it's happening as we speak. It happened on the government in 2015. It was Paris for many people was underrated. They didn't like it. It was under ambitious, but it was the first time humanity had agreed on something. So that's one. The financial market 2020 it happened. I mean, Tesla is worth more than the entire automotive industry. Okay, mm. now you can say it's a bubble, but wait ten years. Okay, there'll be enormous wealth creation in the energy transition. A reallocation of capital similar to a war effort, but in a good way. Okay, and that's happening as we speak. It, that, that inflection point in the capital markets already passed. I think where it's harder is uh, for the incumbents. I mean, uh, Shell is an investor in the company. Um, their heart is in the right place, I guarantee that, but it's really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big boat to turn. It's a big boat to turn. Uh, yeah, we'll see. There's a... Um, there, there will be a change of leadership in uh, in many of those uh, multi um, large large companies because uh, the the markets are detecting that actually they change that they become uh, really compatible with uh, a net zero world. But the the CEOs of those companies are super managers more than leaders, and <coughs> you'll see a change of leadership because of the, the because the capital markets are asking they're asking that they put leaders that will take those companies into a new place. I think, I think that's what BP is trying to do uh, with Bernard Lurie. And, uh, and initially, the cost of going into those markets for them is, by the way, very expensive. I mean, BP is going to lose a lot of money on, <coughs> on the, the bids they made recently in offshore wind, but they do it because they want to penetrate that market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any last question? No? Then again, thanks the speaker very much again. Thank you. Again, please be back at uh, 3 for the panel. Thank you.